So, um, so this is more of a review of what you guys already did it in Physics 4A. The first time I taught Physics 4C a year ago, I thought I could uh, do without having to do this uh, review, save a little bit of time. Then I discovered most people forget about wave stuff in the one year, sorry, one semester since you're Physics 4A. How many of you remember the wave interference from Physics 4A? <laughs> yeah, and half of you were my students. Um, wave interference. Um, tell me what you remember about wave interference. What are some of the things you can, um, what, what are you talking about when we talk about wave interference at all? Okay, some people remember the phrases. Uh, destructive interference. And um, constructive in interference. So what's happening when you have something that you are calling constructive interference? Um, what's happening when something like this happens? Okay, amplitude increases. You can sort of look at it like you have a wave and you, um, let's see. When you have more of one thing, then you have more of one thing. Sort of like, um, I don't know, this is going to be some strained example. It's like um, when I have one tennis ball, I have one tennis ball. I add one more tennis ball to it, now I have two tennis balls. Right? <laughs> so in some sense, constructive interference is sort of, um, it somehow matches better with uh, how you deal with the things that are not waves. Let me uh, use this simulation to actually uh, give you an example of constructive interference. Um, so it's my favorite, it's on my favorite um, simulation side. And this is actually the simulation you would have seen me use in, um, in physics 4A. Oops, not that one. So I have waves on a string, and with this simulation, this is what I can do. I can take uh, two wave pulses and add them together. Let me just do it this way. I happen to know this is what works well. Um, slow motion, let's see, shortest width, that's probably good. All right, so there's a wave, and I add another wave to it. Oops, sorry, uh, no damping. Uh, all right, one more time. I have a wave there. I, oops, ah, sorry. Jumped the gun a little. Wave, add another wave to it. And you see that as they come together, and when they get together, they get bigger, right? So that's a constructive interference. You add two waves, so you could uh, look at it almost like you have one wave, and you add another wave on top of that, and you get one wave that's bigger. <laughs> I don't know, sorry, that sounds a little bit too simplistic. Isn't that the superposition? Yeah, that's what we're gonna get to. So how do you get destructive interference? This is the um, uh, one that where there's non-wave, there is no non-wave analogy to it. It's sort of like, you know, I have one baseball. Is there a way I can add another baseball to it so that they disappear? Antimatter. Yeah, if I, yeah, that's a whole another matter. Um, so with uh, things like uh, objects like a base, sorry, tennis balls, um, there's no way to add them together in a way that they would appear to disappear. But with the waves, you can. In fact, I don't have to change anything here. I can just let it run for a little bit longer and you will see it. There. So I have a wave that's coming in that's right side up, and a wave that's coming that's wrong side up. And you will see that as they overlap, they disappear. So it almost appears as though the, it's gone. So, you know, the simplistic description of destructive interference would be I have a pulse that's negative 
plus I have a pulse that's positive, add them together, I get flat line. But that's a bit simplistic. It's a, uh, there's a more sophisticated description than that. And um, here's a question I guess maybe you should, do. I think you might be able to answer based on intuition, which may be right. If, so right now the time is paused. What do you think will happen when I let time go again? Keep going. I mean, right now there's no wave whatsoever. Why would the wave suddenly reappear when I let time flow again? Because but, the energy is still here. Yeah, yeah, and your intuition is right. So I had a downward pulse that was moving to right, right? And I had an upward pulse that was moving to left. Watch what happens when I let time flow again. Those pulses simply move through each other as though they weren't there before. So if you are just tracking this pulse here, how it moves, you can ignore this pulse altogether. And this will just continue to move the way it always does without any care for the other pulse. This is the most uh, basic thing to understand about wave interaction. How one wave interacts with the other is that they don't. The motion or movement of one wave is completely unaffected by motion or movement of another wave. It's a, it's a, a linear phenomenon. If you are taking linear algebra, you might have covered something called the linearity. Um, so, so all of this is out of, coming out of those mathematical properties. In physics, we call this, this is where that name comes from, superposition principle. And I like to say that we give it such a grand name, superposition principle, because what it says is, is really simple. What it says is that when these two waves overlap, they don't interact with each other. So if you have, um, let's say this wave can be described by function f1 as a function of position and time. And let's say this can be described by function f2 and function of position and time. When both of them are happening in the same medium, as indicated by this plus sign, they are going to be overlapping in space and time, right? And when you look at a string, a given section of string can be at only one position at any given point in time. So um, when these two waves overlap, there is really going to be only a single function of position and time. And what superposition principle says is that the way you get this is the simplest mathematical operation possible. You take this, you take this, and you simply add them together. So this is f1 xt plus f2 xt. So everything else we are going to talk about uh, with wave interference comes from this. So we have a source of wave, which is producing some um, wave. In case of light, this will be a wave of electric field. And we have another source of wave. And when we consider the combined effect of those two sources, we simply add them. We don't do anything to anything else. And if you remove one of the two sources, then the whatever effect the first source would have produced is still there. Now, what is interesting, and sorry, I'm making this sound very boring, but <laughs> that's why I'm glad some, some of you mentioned the destructive and constructive interference. You do see interesting patterns. And these interesting patterns you see are the result of working through this math. So I guess uh, maybe um, as a way of uh, review, I should uh, remind you of uh, one of the examples of the wave interference, one of the examples of wave interference. So in physics 4A, you should have covered two examples of wave interference. One is a standing wave, and the other is a beat, as in acoustic or audio beat. No, I don't know, uh, well, beat as in beat frequency. How many of you here remember the phrase bit frequency? OK. 
Okay, not many of you. Oh, at least people who took my class, some of you do. <laughs> not all of you. Um, how many here remember hearing something about standing wave? Really? Do other physics 4A instructors not cover waves? <laughs> okay, well, they should have. Um, let me do this much. So I guess um, if I told you, I, I think, so the, here's the nice thing about wave. Uh, you can talk about wave as a purely mathematical idea. You, it doesn't even have to be physical. I mean, when you look at wave on a string, there is some physical law describing what's happening here. That's why, you know, when you change the tension, that changes how these waves behave. But at the end of the day, um, you can describe waves as purely mathematically. So let's uh, take that point of view. Um, you can, if I told you that there is a source of wave here, that, uh, um, that's a sort of source of some, it's generating some mathematical function, I can tell you that this is generating a sinusoidal mathematical function. So something like this. That makes sense? Like nothing unusual there. Uh, what function would you use to describe this function that you are seeing? So right now you are seeing it as a function of time and you can imagine freezing it in time and describe it only purely as a function of position. So right now, what you are seeing would look like a height of the bit as a function of the x location of bit. And right now, you could say it's at time equals 0. Or if you allow time to flow again, then it would be you know, y as a function of position and time. What kind of function, mathematical function, would you use to describe this? Something like sine, right? So let's say it's a proportion, or um, it's time, some amplitude times sine of, and it's this portion that you have to work out. So this portion will need to have position and time in it. Yeah, you might have this memorized, in which case it's good. <laughs> um, um, how, how many of you are remembering something like this? Let me do a quick introduction of all these uh, parameters which might be new to maybe a third of you. Um, a amplitude, that seems good enough to everyone, okay. Um, what's probably, I mean, x and t, those are your variables. What's new to you is pro omega, even omega might be reasonably familiar. This is angular frequency. So omega angular frequency is 2 pi times frequency, or it's a 2 pi divided by period t, right? What's probably um, unfamiliar to people who are just seeing waves now is this k, or what we call wave number. So let me just write down the definition of wave number. So the wave number k is, um, it's 2 pi divided by wavelength lambda. Everyone here knows wavelength lambda, right? You know what wavelength is? That's length from here to, uh, sorry, length from here to here. That's the wavelength. So, uh, so the way you, the best way to look at this k is it's similar to omega, except in relation to position. So t is how long of a time it takes for a wave to repeat itself, right? That's the period. <laughs> Wavelength lambda is how long of a space it takes for a wave to repeat itself. So the way you define angular frequency in terms of period is similar to how we define wave number in terms of wavelength. So that's the explanation of this parameter. I guess, um, um, let me give you, try to give you this much intuition. So. Let me check how much time I have. Um, let me try to give you this much intuition. So let's say, let me freeze it in time. And this is the claim I want to make. I want to make the claim that this expression already tells you in which direction the wave is moving. This expression already tells you that the wave is moving to the right instead of to the left. So for those of you who are in my physics 4A, hopefully you remember. I think we spent enough time on this. Um, many of you were not in my physics 4A. So this is how I reasoned this through. 
uh, let's say I take a particular point on the wave. It doesn't have to be this point, but it's a convenient point. Let's take, I take this particular point on, this, um, on the wave. Do you know what the value of, what the value of sine of whatever it is inside should be equal to for this point? Okay. Well, the, so the sine will be one, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> so that's one. So, and as this wave moves, there is a point that's at this point. So at some later point, if you are looking at this same point in position, then you know, it's not at this value anymore. It's no longer right, right? But there's another point for which you can say sine of whatever it is is still equal to one. And when you are looking at movement of wave, you are really tracking this movement here. So for you to keep track of the same point, whose value of sign is not changing, what you really need to be able to say is that whatever this value is, I guess pi over two, <laughs> this value has to stay constant. Good? So this has to remain at pi over two for this to be true. So as you look at this expression, you imagine this. As my t, time, as my time increases, so I'm moving forward in time, how should my x change so that this combination kx minus omega t does not change? So as time increases, should my x increase or decrease? So that all, this whole thing stays co constant. Decrease, look at it again. Increase, right, because of this minus sign. Yeah, so that's why this is telling you that this wave is moving to right. Imagine I had it reversed. Imagine this was instead of a plus sign. In what direction will wave be moving? The other way. Because then now you will say as t increases, x has to decrease to keep this constant. So I guess that's the um, quickest uh, introduction to traveling periodic wave I can do in the time. So I want you to introduce this so that I can talk about at least the standing wave as a way of reviewing about waves and wave interference. The wave interference we are going to cover in this class, it's going to be slightly more complicated. So in physics 4A, unless you took it with someone who covers more material than I do, um, you didn't look at any wave interference in more than one dimension. This is a one dimensional wave. So uh, what we are going to do in this class, we are, we are going to start looking at waves that are traveling in two dimensions. So we are, we'll look at path lengths in two dimensions. So, um, so I want, to, want you to review the wave interference in one dimension so that when we move on to two dimension, at least some of the concepts will seem familiar. So let me actually set up a standing wave here so that you can kind of see it. Um, I usually try to do this as a physical demo too, but I don't think there's time for it. So to have a standing wave, so I will never get a standing wave with this setup. I need two sources of wave. I need one source of wave that's moving from left to right that's going to be coming from here. And I need another source of wave that's coming from right to left. Now, in this program, there's nothing that's generating wave here. But what I can have is uh, set an end here so that the wave will reflect from this end and come back. Good. Let me just reset because there's a little bump there. Now, when you just set it like this, you won't get a standing wave. Um, like you look at it for a while and it, it's going to begin to look chaotic, but you'll say, oh, all right, um, it's chaotic, nothing, no pattern of any kind. So let me do something that will help me get an actual pattern. Um, once again, I'm watching my time. Where's my clock? Oh, okay, 20 minutes. Um, all right, so I need to first measure some stuff. Uh, let me go back to pulse. Restart. Um, pulse wealth, okay, I need a timer. Start the timer. It doesn't start yet because it's a timer for the simulation time. Okay, I'm going to generate one pulse and then just to see uh, how long it takes to get there. Uh, one pulse. Um, pause here and gingerly go to when it just barely reaches that point. 
Okay, 1.18 second. Um, so in terms of frequency, it's the reciprocal of that. So let me do that. Uh, 1 over 1.18, so 0 0.85 hertz. So I feel like 0 0.85 hertz is going to be a special frequency. So let me set it to be 0 0.85 hertz here. And let me tell you one more thing. I feel like whatever effect I'm going to get is going to be huge or huge. So let me set a very small amplitude. I don't feel like I need a very large amplitude to get something huge. All right, that's probably good enough. And I don't need timer anymore. Uh, I probably need a normal time. It's going to take too long otherwise. Mm, yeah, let me erase this while it's getting going. So this is what's called the standing wave. It's also called the resonance. How many here are familiar with the idea of resonance? Yeah. So resonance. So you get resonance whenever you have a standing wave on something. This is how bridges get destroyed by strong winds. <laughs> if you said there's a Tacoma bridge or whatever, you might have seen video of. Um, so now it turns out you can, uh, there are other frequencies where this uh, standing wave can be set up. You can do this at half the frequency. So 0 0.4, um, uh, 4, 2, 4, 3, let me do 4, 3. 0 0.43 hertz. Um, that also gives you a standing wave. And actually, um, for this setup, all the integer mul multiple of this will give you a standing wave. Um, so uh, let me just do one more. Um, so it'll be three times this, so 1.29. Yeah. So with the different frequencies, the exact pattern is different but all of them share some similar features. They all have points that barely move. Those are called nodes. And some nodes are nodes by physical reason. This is a node because this clamp prevents anything from moving there. Yeah, sorry, that's just, I think 1.28 might actually work better. Um, so the end point here is a node because it's not allowed to move. And the point here is a node because I set my amplitude very small. But some of the nodes, like these nodes here, there's nothing physically holding anything there. They are nodes because of destructive interference. That's what I mean, wave interference is uh, more interesting than I <laughs> made out to be at the very beginning. Um, so I guess, let's see, do I want to work through the math? Um, I, I don't know. I kind of want you to introduce a complex exponential at some point, but I feel like I don't want to do that until next week. If I try to do it this week, I think it's going to be a lot of math, and many of you won't see the point. Um, so actually, let me work through the math uh, using trigonometry, and next week, I can redo this derivation using complex exponential. Then, um, then it'll uh, have a little bit of a point to that. So uh, this is how you, sorry, um, let me go back to 0 0.85 hertz. That works a lot better than any of this. Um, so, so this is how we mathematically describe this standing wave. We look at it as a superposition of two waves. One wave that's traveling from left to right and another wave that's traveling from right to left. And they are timed in such a way, they have a wavelength in such a way so that this pattern exactly fits. But the, um, so let me uh, start out with that. So this is the uh, mathematical description of, let me turn on the light here. Uh, uh, mathematical, Description of standing wave. So for the wave, 
on the, the one single wave on this medium, you want to describe the single function as a function of position and time. And my claim is that this can be done by describing as a superposition, superposition of two waves, one that's traveling to the right. So that would be what you saw before. Uh, so some amplitude times sine of kx minus omega t plus another wave that's traveling to the left that has the same frequency and same wavelength. So let me write that down. Um, plus same amplitude times sine of kx plus omega t. Now, let me ask you this question. As you stare at this mathematical function, does it sound right to you that the, sh sorry, this shape keeps changing? It's because this is not the exactly correct frequency. But so you see this uh, shape that you see, you know, sinusoidal shape with uh, amplitude changing up and down, not moving anywhere. Does this obviously look like what this should look like? Really? Like as you look at this function, it's obvious to you that there's a point that never moves at all point at moments in time. Not really, right? <laughs> so, um, so this is what I mean by mathematical derivation. So, or mathematical description. We are going to take this uh, um, mathematical expression and we are going to rewrite it in a way that as you will look at the resulting expression, it's going to be clear to you that yes, that function actually describes this. And what that function will look like is this. The function that describes this, function of some position and time, it's going to look like a product of a sinusoidal function of position alone and sinusoidal function of time alone. It'll look like sine of kx times, let's say, sine of omega t. It could be cosine. I think it might actually be cosine. Sine, I, I don't know, it could be cosine. <laughs> sine or cosine. Uh, like if you got this function, then is that clear to you that yes, this is what you expect to see? As in when cosine of or sine of omega t is one, you see the say, you do see this shape. When sine of omega t is one, you do see this shape, right? Sine of kx. And at some later time, when, oops, um, I went past it. Well, when sine of omega t is minus one, you would see this. When sine of omega t is zero, you, well, no. When sine of omega t is zero, you would see this. So if you got a function that looks like this, then um, you can draw a clear connection between this mathematical description to the shape you are seeing, right? So that is the goal. I want to take this expression and rewrite it up to a point where it's a product of two sinusoidal function of a single x or time alone. And uh, let me try to do this as quickly as possible. Oh, I have only 10 minutes. I want you to do more. Um, yeah, let me do this quickly. I can do this in five minutes and I can show other uh, examples of interference here. So, all right. So in the interest of time, I'll just tell you what I'm going to use. I'm going to use the trig identity that I've been telling you guys in the last lab. I tell people this is the most useful trig identity. You should have this memorized. It's angle addition formula. Sine of alpha plus minus beta is equal to sine of alpha cosine of beta plus minus sine of beta cosine of alpha cosine of alpha plus minus beta is equal to cosine of alpha cosine of beta minus plus sine of alpha oops, sine of alpha sine of beta i can tell you how often these uh, identities are useful and if you want to drive it from scratch it's almost uh, uh, for me it's impossible it takes way too much geometric reasoning so I'm going to use this to simplify this. And you can almost see a natural way of doing it. This is written as sine of one angle minus another angle. So I can use this angle addition formula to expand it out. So let's do that and see what we get. 
when I expand that out, I get a times sine of kx, that's alpha, uh, times cosine of beta, that's omega t, yeah, cosine of omega t, and it's minus, so I should pick minus here, minus um, sine of omega t, oops, I, sine of omega t, cosine of alpha, which is kx. Okay, that's my first term here, plus a times, um, it, this, it's the same thing except this is the plus sign. So it's a sine of kx, kx times cosine of omega t, this time it's plus sine of omega t times cosine of kx. And as you stare at this, I hope you know this, that um, these two terms are the same, exactly, and these two terms are exact opposites of each other. So when you add them, these two will cancel. And you are left with what we wanted from the beginning. Um, so two of these, so two times a, two a, sine of kx times cosine of omega t. So I haven't really done anything. I just took this expression and rewrote it into this form. But this form makes it clearer that what the shape of the wave should look like this instead of whatever this tells you it should be. Yeah. So this is a um, I don't know, quick review of what you should have learned in physics 4A. <laughs> um, I guess uh, oftentimes when you're taking physics 4A, the wave um, appears to be a small part of the curriculum, and it you know, frankly is. But in this class, if I had to pick one thing that's going to be a constant theme throughout the entire semester, it's actually waves. Um, it comes up with uh, optics. It'll come up definitely with the quantum mechanics. And I can also introduce it into uh, special relativity if I tried. And so, um, so this is a quick review. And the complication we are going to get in, so this is physics, physics 4A material. We are, I'm not, I don't have any homework problem on this. Uh, if you need to review it, look at University of Physics Volume 1. Um, so what we are going to look at in this class is um, interference phenomena that you see with light. And with the light, um, standing waves here are kind of hard to get. I mean, you can, but it kind of takes a research lab level technology, fabric repair. We're not going to do that. Um, uh, what we can do is we can do um, we can start out with something called the double slit interference. And let me use this demonstration to actually show you what that looks like. So this is not obviously not light wave. But I can still illustrate the features of the interference with the light wave that you will see. Um, so right now what you are seeing is, um, I don't know, wave from a single source. Oops. Wave from a single source. Good. So I have a source there that's being shaken. I have a source there that, oh, can I do it this way? Oh, maybe, yeah. I have a source there that's being shaken at some constant frequency. So it's generating this wave that's coming out. And as you saw, the only reason it looks stationary is because the strobe light is locked. Okay. okay. All right. So with this, you don't see any interference because you have a single source. Um, well, no interference. This is what double slit interference looks like. Let me replace this. Um, so by the way, if you are looking at it here, this is, this is my single wave source. Let me replace that with the two sources that are going to be in phase, meaning they are going to be shaking together. So this is my two sources. Each of them will be like a single one of this, um, except they shake together. And watch what happens when I turn it up. Yeah, oh, I guess I must have set the frequency. So you get a pattern that's uh, more complex and interesting than any one single one of them together. 
I don't know if I can, oh, I cannot just stop one of them. I don't think I can reach in and do that. But do you see, um, so you see, so when you're looking at this region, where it's far away from the other source and it's uh, presumably influenced by only one of them, you see that it's uh, much like the other um, case, right? When you look at in between, that's when you see more interesting patterns. And to me, this, or well, to us, uh, especially as we look at it on Thursday, this is particularly interesting pattern. What do you see along this line that I'm dotting out? Do you notice anything along that line? You might call it destructive interference. So what you're seeing is that along this line, it looks as though it looks the same as when this was off, right? Just completely flat water surface, just along that line. And you deviate a little bit one way or the other, you get these wave fronts again. But just along this line, you get no waves. So yeah, this is the line along which a destructive interference happens. And we'll look at the mathematics of this more, but this is how we are going to analyze it. Let's say you pick a point on this line. Then what you can look at this as is there's a wave that's arriving at this point from this um, source. And there's a wave that's arriving at the point from this source. Yeah. They both have same wavelength. I could almost illustrate this wave this way. You know, this is the kind of, uh, how am I doing this? I guess wherever there's black, I'm gonna have a cross. So, something like this, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I started out okay and then messed up. Um, and there's a wave that's coming from here that looks kind of like that too. And uh, sorry, I'm not drawing this right. And somehow the way they are adding up here, they add destructively. Whenever this wave goes this, um, let's say whenever water surface from this wave goes down, water surface from this wave goes up. Whenever, the, the, whenever this comes up, this goes down. We call that out of phase and we'll, I guess, give a description for that a little bit more on Thursday as we work out the mathematics for double slit interference pattern. But this is the mental image I want you to have. That uh, when we are talking about double slit interference or double slit interference pattern for light, uh, what you should imagine is here's a source of wave, here's a source of wave. They are synchronized. They are in phase. They shake together. And as they do, um, this, uh, Oscillations, they propagate out to, it, it fills up the whole space. And for a given point in space, the effect here, let's say, call it the water height at this particular point, call that x naught as a vector, um, as a function of time, that can be described as a um, influence due to one source, y1, x naught t, plus influence due to other source, x naught t. And we are going to be able to, have, able to figure out that for some of the points, these will be constructive interference. They will move together. For some of the other points, they will be destructive interference. Um, just the one change that I should make for the sake of accurateness for the next time is that for the light waves, we are not dealing with the water level. We are not dealing with the height of the water. What we are instead of dealing with is electric field. It's an electric field that we are dealing with. Because um, this, is, this is why it was important that we started the, this semester by talking about the, the light as an electromagnetic wave. So what we are going to spend some time talking about it is um, how the electromagnetic, electric field of electromagnetic waves from here, an electric field of electromagnetic waves from here will add it together here in this spot in such a way. For certain spots, like this point here, they will always add up to zero at all times. Or at certain spots, I guess like here, 
it'll add up so that it's at a maximum value. I mean, it'll still sometimes be zero at a particular moment in time, but the amplitude will be at a maximum. Good. Okay, so let me leave you there. Um, I guess that's good timing. <laughs> let me leave you there. So on Thursday, we will um, go over double solid interference in more detail.